Hey everyone, thank you for being back for chapter 8, uh, The Nativist Reaction. Um, this one is going to be an interesting chapter because uh, we're going to go into a little more specific detail. Um, what is, you know, nativism? <clears throat> what does a nativist reaction uh, during the 20th century look like? Uh, intertwined a little bit with the Red Scare and communism and the Bolsheviks. Uh, and here... Um, I chose this particular kind of like introductory slide and uh, political cartoon because it shows Uncle Sam, the United States, right, and liberty um, and the dangers to American ideas, institutions. And so here you have the long sea of the riffraff immigration, right? And so all of these different types of immigrants here, right? The anarchists, the illiterate, the outlaws, the mafias, the criminals, right? Trying to get into the country and destroy the United States. Um, and so uh, this kind of represents sort of the nativist reaction and what it is going to mean and represent. So, um, yeah, let's uh, start without further ado. So if you uh, want a quick... Uh, sort of recap of nativism in the 1920s. Uh, this uh, uh, video does a decent job of describing some of those, uh, you know, ideas, right, intertwined with what is nativism and, uh, you know, how they progressed in the 1920s and how all of these different factors, right, were coming together, um, you know, at an intersectional moment of U.S. history. But uh, let's say if we were looking past World War One. Uh, we start to see a rise in nativist reactions. Uh, and what is nativism at the heart of it? Nativism itself is the promoting of the native, native inhabitants and their well-being over any immigrant. So, for instance, all of us living in the United States here today, let's say if we are permanent U.S. citizens, any immigrants coming into the States, we are going to be uh, wary and... Uh, cautious of them, right? We don't know who they are. We don't know whether they're going to acclimate correctly to the United States. Um, we're going to be fearful that they're taking our jobs um, and our livelihoods and that their, their children and their different cultures are going to be intermixed with ours. So a nativist reaction is whatever the current homogeneous-esque population of the country is, they are very wary of the immigrants coming in uh, and trying to set up a life for themselves. And during this time, in the kind of early 1900s, uh, especially after World War One, and the reason this post is after World War One is because at the end of World War One we had the Russian Empire disintegrate because the Bolshevik Revolution and the Communists took over, and so we see an introduction of what is called the Red Scare, the promotion and widespread fear of a potential uprising of a communistic or some type of anarchy, Marxist uh, society within the United States. And somehow the commies are going to come and get us. And so both of these uh, two terms and ideologies kind of intersected at the perfect moment in the Sacco Vanzetti case. This was a case in the 1920s where two Italian-American uh, anarchists and immigrants, but they were known anarchists because they were reading a lot of Marxist ideologies at the time. But they were found guilty of a crime and executed for it. However, there was very little evidence linking them to the crime itself. So as the story goes, these two gentlemen were walking past a robbery scene. They had nothing to do with it, but because they quote unquote kind of looked similar, I guess, to the culprits, the police ended up arresting them. They went through a very lengthy trial process, and after the trial process, the judge himself um, started to write his you know, version of the trial and his ultimate decision. And the ultimate decision had various kind of anti-immigrant, anti-Italian rhetoric in it, and anti-Bolshevik. Uh, and so the judge, you know, kind of was having some blatant racism slash anti-communistic views hence probably why the case went so far as it did but to many americans this case because there was not a lot of evidence linking them to the crime um, they thought that it was exemplifying xenophobia racism treating immigrants like second-class people and opinions of the trial itself were divided amongst nativist lines so if you are more nativist 
and more fearful of immigrants. You could say that, well, you know, these folks are just robbing and pillaging good American businesses, right? They deserve to be put put to death and found guilty, etc. They probably did it. If you're a less nativist and you're more open and accepting, you would probably say that, well, you know, they're living in the United States of America. We have due process here in this country. And so it was there was not a lot of evidence linking them to this particular crime. So they did not deserve to be found guilty and especially executed for it. Um, a few, few years later, six, in fact, after the trial, Felix Frankfurter, a Harvard Law School professor and eventual U.S. Supreme Court member, said, by systemic exploitation of the defendant's alien blood, right, they're, they're uh, Italian immigrants, their imperfect knowledge of English, their unpopular social views, right, anarchy slash Marxism, and their opposition to the war, the district attorney invoked against them a riot of political passion and patriotic sentiment. And the trial judge connived at, uh, one had almost written, cooperated in the process. So essentially, the U.S. Supreme Court member is saying that this trial judge essentially just sent them towards their death because he got wrapped up in this nativist reaction. Um, and so it was pretty sad to see. Um, if you have a, a couple minutes of free time, definitely watch this video on the trial of Sacco and Banzetti and the entire nativist fear of immigrants, right? It kind of really encapsulate it uh, during the time. And so Mr. Sacco and Mr. Banzetti sitting here, right, in the courtroom, chained up together. And very quickly, nationally and even internationally, um, protests started uh, because the newspaper started to publish it, right? The newspaper is doing a fantastic job of just getting this information to the forefront of the public. And so Sacco and Vanzetti, protest demonstration against the death sentence. And so, so many folks were trying to save them because, number one, the evidence was a bit sparse. So even if they were, let's say, found guilty, keep them in jail. Don't give them the death sentence. But eventually... Um, they were handed down the death sentence, and both of them were killed via a, um, electric chair in uh, Massachusetts State Prison. And so the news went wild, right, um, with, you know, this news. And so two men who were, you know, having loose connections to this potential case suddenly got the death penalty. And so they had millions of sympathizers um, and it was, you know, having international support as well because folks were looking inward at the United States in this moment and saying that especially the sentence of death was in doubt, right? Why go that extreme? And so the, the, that reaction of nativism was definitely uh, kind of the epitome, right, of nativism at the time. Now, let's talk a little bit about the 1920s uh, and 30s in terms of an Italian dry land um, and how Prohibition and Al Capone ended up coming into this uh, kind of, uh, you know, understanding uh, or let's say stereotype of Italian mafias. So during the Prohibition era, and let us not forget that the United States for 13 years from 1920 to 1933 was a dry land. We had a nationwide constitutional ban on the production, importation, transportation of alcohol. So the 18th Amendment was passed in 1919 um, that all of these intoxicating liquors were now to be banned, right? Banned substances. Now, they were brought about heavily by lobbyists from the female temperance groups. A temperance group is one that wants to heavily limit or ban alcohol from society and the reason that they were why i write here female temperance groups is because uh most of them were female driven christian temperance groups right of wives of daughters of sisters of many of these husbands coming drunk home uh uh you know from drinking out in the parlor and spending whatever little money that the family had. And then, the, you know, these ladies saw this as a deterioration of the nuclear family dynamic. And I want to give a little context and backstory because this is a pretty interesting history. So 
throughout the 16-1700s, as the colonies are progressing, as the United States is born, etc., um, it started to become a tradition in North America to have a few drinks throughout the day. But at that time, all of the drinks were very low alcohol content, sort of like cider beer, right? They're like, I don't know, like 2% alcohol, right? Something like that, very low. So you could have a few drinks throughout the day. But they started to develop that habit into like a cultural habit of, you like during breakfast, you have a drink. Uh, midday, you have a drink. Uh, you meet up with your friends uh, just to celebrate, you have a drink. You go to do some business, you have a drink. You come home for dinner, you have a drink, right? Like it's just multiple drinks throughout the day. Now, if it's like cider, that's fine, right? You're not going to get too crazy. However, once we started like rolling into the 1800s, uh, hard liquor, you know, gets developed and widespread and becomes a lot more accessible for folks. So now the same cultural prevalence is still there. So the men are still having drinks throughout the day, but now it's like hard liquor. So they're coming home ragingly drunk. Um, even, uh, you know, let's say uh, even guys today, right? We have our white undershirts. The nickname for those white undershirts are wife beaters. Where do you think the nickname came from? And so, you know, these uh, these female temperance groups were trying to ban um, alcohol, right? And they ended up succeeding after all the lobbying they did. They passed the 18th Amendment. And so they truly saw it as kind of a deterioration of American values, right? In comes Al Capone and the other uh, sort of bootleggers at the time. And so he had the nickname Scarface. And he was an American gangster and businessman who was notorious during this prohibition era because he was essentially a mafia boss. He was in charge of this whole organization um, as the crime syndicate boss and yearly had approximately 100 plus million dollars annually, right? This was a huge racketeering, uh, you know, endeavor. They were involved in bootlegging, speakeasy bars, prostitution, gambling, loan sharking, murder, etc. But, you know, as far as the nativist reaction goes, this fed into this kind of like Italian mafia stereotype, right? Even today, we see so many famous films with like Robert De Niro and uh, Al Pacino, right? Kind of like this Italian mobster kind of days, right? Or The Sopranos, if you've ever seen those type of shows. And so, you know, this really started to kind of permeate itself into the um, into the kind of uh, large culture at B and fed into a lot of those like societal insecurities that people were having at the time against immigrants and especially Italians, right, as well. So Mr. Al Capone here, right, the man, the myth, the legend, um, you know, I'm not sure how much that suit costs, but if you're making m millions upon millions during this day and age, I'm pretty sure it's the finest silk the world has ever seen. Um, here's a couple of uh, interesting videos for you to watch if you have some spare time on like prohibition in the U.S., national ban of alcohol, uh, kind of detailing what life and society was during this time. Um, and also um, on the left-hand side video from Mojo, it details uh, a little bit more on the speakeasies of the day. Um, if, if any of you are 21 plus in my classes, you'll understand what a speakeasy is. For those of you who have not yet seen something like this, a speakeasy traditionally, and even today, they try to dress it up as such. Um, you go to this random location and the door looks completely normal. Um, or let's say it's a hid hidden secret door behind a bookcase or something. And then you like pull a book and the bookcase opens up and it's like the entrance into like a secret underground drinking lair or parlor. Um, so people had to get very, uh, you know, unique with a lot of their entrances back in the day. Interesting fun fact about the Prohibition era. Um, people invented the cocktails, right? So you know how today we have cocktails. So you have your alcohol, you have your lime, you have your juices, and you have your sugar on the rim of the glass, etc. Uh, the reason that cocktails were born here is because as alcohol started getting more and more limited, right? Um, people started to make their own bootleg alcohol in their bathtubs and it tasted nasty. And so to cover up that disgustingness, they started to add in all of this additional flavoring to make it taste better. Now, of course, modernly, we do not have that same issue because we have clean, pure, like good alcohol plus all of the additional flavoring. Um, however, that's just an interesting little side note. 
Um, so in instead of tasting the person's bath water in your mouth, you're tasting, let's say, lime or something else a little better. Ah, culture wars. So here we have the rise of Christian fundamentalism. So as the early 1900s are kind of rolling on and we start to see a much more modern, diverse, religiously open, ethnically plural, and shall I say, sexually risque culture, right? Um, as society is kind of thriving and growing, uh, we start to see a fundamentalist reaction. Because I always say this in all my classes. As far as life goes, as, as far as politics goes, wherever, whenever society skews too far left or too far right, there's always going to be a counter reaction to it, right? Um, and so on the right side of the spectrum, we have the fundamentalists all throughout the 20s and the 30s. And so this was an anti-modernist Protestant movement stating that the Bible has the literal truth proclaimed inside of it. And within their writings, the, the fundamentals, um, the conservative leaders were arguing that traditional family values were at a decline, that morality was at a decline, that Christian views and family dynamics were being destroyed. And only through God, only through the Bible of viewing this literal truth of the world, can we bring back the United States of America as it should be, as it was. And so with the rise of these culture wars, with the rise of fundamentalism and this uh, sort of Protestant Christian view, we start to see that nativist reactions also increase because the more conservative one gets, it tends to be the case that they like to see uh, very stringent borders of the country, right? They like to for things to be very organized. And so uh, additional waves of immigration does not kind of fit that narrative for them. Um, and so a perfect example of the fundamentalist, uh, fundamentalism kind of reaching its apex was this famous Scopes trial or the Scopes quote-unquote monkey trial in 1925 where the trial of John Scopes, a Tennessee teacher, accused of violating state law, um, prohibiting teaching of the theories of evolution. Uh, he either co covered evolution or it was in the book that he was teaching. Um, but either way, it became a nationwide case um, and started to turn into a fundamentalism versus a civil liberties lawsuit um, where the fundamentalists were arguing that the state law prohibits the usage of uh, and the teaching of evolution. But the civil liberties side is saying, well, you can't necessarily punish him for that, right? It's in the textbook already, right? And the theory is out there, so he could mention it, right? It's freedom of speech. So definitely, definitely an interesting time in the nation's history. Um, and this is a very uh, interesting kind of video kind of detailing the Scopes trial with some very early rare footage of what was called the trial of the century, right? For the famous Scopes monkey trial. Oh, I absolutely love these political cartoons. So if you look here on the left-hand side, and this is all with religious uh, viewings, right? So this is supposed to be the descent of the modernists, right? Over here on the, oh, sorry. Over here on the top right-hand side, if you can tell, right, this is all white. It is all uh, sort of the very angelic white being on the upper right-hand side, thereby den denoting some type of, you know, let's say, heavenly energy but as you can tell as this gentleman is kind of going down the stairs he is further going into this kind of dark place of atheism over here at the very bottom and so we have christianity and then slowly but surely man not made in god's image no miracles no deity no resurrection at the very bottom of the stairs atheism um, and so it's just a very grim <laughs> outlook on if you're turning your back to god you are kind of entering the lair of the devil and over here we have um, an atheist right kind of singing the praise of darwinian hypothesis uh, of, of uh, evolution um, towards the people and towards the path of education he is slowly leading them into the disbelief in the god of the bible and so all these political cartoons are kind of 
advocating for fundamentalism and a return to good old Christian values. Even here, in the tree of knowledge, we have evolution, archaeology, biology, and the fundamentalist is saying, halt to our children. You are not going to learn this. You must learn the Bible. And the verdict of the trial scopes is that thou shalt not think. So I love these propagandas, right? Go, kind of going through at this time. Another nativist reaction, perhaps the ultimate nativist reaction, was the second coming of the Ku Klux Klan. The first coming of the Ku Klux Klan happened right after the Civil War ended, uh, during Reconstruction. They were eventually, um, they were eventually stamped out of existence thanks to uh, the uh, thanks to Congress and thanks to President Ulysses S. Grant because they uh, made and they announced that the Ku Klux Klan was a domestic terrorist organization and they arrested a bunch of its leaders. And so the Klan kind of dispersed. However, the second Klan began to emerge once again. And so this was a very, uh, you know, kind of resurgence amongst the Klan because now they came back with a vengeance. Um, as immigration increased, right, because, you know, now we're talking about, let's say, the 1920s, 1930s, right, something like that. Uh, immigration is a lot more than it used to be from, like, 1865, right? The cities are much more diverse than they used to be in 1865. And so now they are truly, right, this Protestant white America. They are advocating for a 100% Americanism. Um, and that the, the American melting pot has become too diverse. This is seen perfectly in the 1915 lynching of Leo Frank, a Jewish factory manager, accused of killing and raping a teenage girl. He was sentenced to death for rape slash murder. However, the court then changed his sentence to life in prison. A mob of local fathers and brothers um, formed what is known as the Knights of Mary Fagan and broke into prison and bu publicly took him into the public square and lynched him. Now, this was causing such a ruckus because, number one, this is essentially Wild West justice, not something that should be happening in the modernized Western world. Number two, uh, he was a Jewish factory manager, so anti-Semitism was hugely prevalent in the discussions, right, of this terrible tragedy. Number three, all of these individuals, instead of, let's say, having some type of like KKK hood on, no, they publicly, their faces were there. They were taking the photo next to the man hanging. I had the photo to show all of you, but I thought better against it. I didn't want to be too graphic, but amongst the individuals that were there participating in the lynching was the judge himself. And so this is a very contested trial even to today um, because there were a lot of accusations that Leo Frank was a pedophile and that he was taking girls up to his factory and upstairs to his office and essentially just you know hashtag me too right having a terrible time with them um, and so you know is this is this truly is, is, is there some truth in the middle was he, let's say, doing horrible, horrific things and then all of the fathers and the brothers got together and lynched him because he was not going to die for his crimes? Or was this a truly kind of like Jewish anti-Semitic, let's say, lynching? Um, and so it may perhaps some truth in the middle. But the one thing that we know for sure is that a lot of these members were parts of the Knight of Mary Fagan, which was a kind of subsidiary of the Klan. In the 20s in Oregon, we start to see that students attending, uh, that, that Oregon is requiring all students to attend public schools um, and stipulating to them that they cannot have any Bolshev uh, Bolsheviks, uh, syndicalists and communists, right, starting their own schools. Oregon, today, modernly with Seattle and all of the coffee shops, it's nice and hipster and like liberal. Oregon back in the day used to be the, one of the main headquarters for the Ku Klux Klan. So let us not forget our history here. The mid-1920s, with all of its fundamentalist rise, saw a huge resurgence. Uh, more than 3 million people were rejoining this reborn clan. The second wave uh, 
burned across the United States, past the you know Sun Belt South, into the North, into the West, and were telling their members and the white Protestant members of society that you know the America was being attacked by the Jews, the Catholics, the Blacks, the immigrants, the feminists, the unions, the immoralists, the corporations, pretty much everyone that they did not like, which was everyone aside from them. And the organization, although it teetered here and there over the decades, it is still alive today. We still have Ku Klux Klan members and headquarters even today. Um, one of the videos that I typically like showing is the uh, uh, the Daryl, uh, you know, video, Daryl Davis, where he famously kind of talks to KKK members and has them eventually, hopefully, right, kind of get out of the clan by uh, getting to know each other. Further along our nativist conversations, the term illegal alien, where did it come from? It stemmed from the Immigration Act of 1924 where the act was referring to immigrants crossing the U.S. border in excess of their immigration quotas and referring to them specifically as illegal aliens. Now, this was traditionally given to Southern and Eastern Europeans. However, today, modernly, it is given mostly to Latinos, right, crossing the border. And we uh, see this rhetoric of illegal aliens, right, kind of used time and time again in politics and especially for presidential elections because it garners more political favor and votes. Today, the modern uh, conversation is between conservative and liberal. The conservatives love to use the term illegals. The, uh, the Democrats and the liberals like to use the term undocumented. Either way, they're talking about pretty much the same demographic of people here, but it's the way that they go about it and kind of the language and rhetoric and the intent behind those words that is different. And so the nativist reactions here are um, definitely prevalent. Now, here's a wonderful thing. Art meets racist propaganda. Now, for those of you who do not know what uh, Birth of a Nation is, let me explain. And I'll explain it from the artistic perspective, and then I will move into the racist propaganda perspective. Now, as Hollywood is growing in the early 1900s, as film is developing... As movies are just starting to, you know, rise. The Birth of a Nation was the first blockbuster Hollywood film ever made. It was a three plus hour film and it was a huge hit. It was shown in the White House. Um, it was shown in almost every movie theater, right? It was this big, uh, just monster of a blockbuster. And from a technical standpoint, from a film standpoint, from a visual standpoint, and technical standpoint, it was, you know, masterful, right? It used all of this new modern technology to show, uh, you know, the film, to cut in between scenes, to have these large pitched battles, right? Um, in order to kind of, you know, show the progress that they've made as a movie. So from a filmmaking standpoint, it was, you know, it has solidified itself in history as being like a quintessential, like, step up for filmmaking. And film, even today, is such a large industry that we all love and enjoy. However, the entirety of the film is, without a doubt, objectively speaking, one of the most racist propaganda-filled films that mankind has ever created. So this was, the film is set in the sort of uh, Reconstruction era, American Civil War era. And... It has very dramatic and overt racism built in to its script and very positive portrayals of the Ku Klux Klan. For example, uh, one of the main um, antagonists is, you know, all the actors are white, but the antagonist is supposed to be a black man. But it's a white actor with original OG blackface, right, as makeup. And so he's running, I don't know why they're in the wilderness, but they're like near a mountaintop in like the forest. And so, you know, he, quote unquote, the black guy is running, you know, tour is running after this uh, poor, virtuous uh, white woman. And then, you know, uh, he kind of gets closer and closer. And then she's like, I, you know, she just like mum mutters something. And then she tosses herself off the cliff to her death, essentially signifying then rather than be um, ravaged by the savage, right? She chooses to 
remain virtuous and remain, you know, uh, untouched, right? And so death is better than that. And every single scene of, let's say, uh, towns and cities being ravaged by these like lying, poor, crooky, scummed, uh, you know, African Americans, then suddenly the white horses with the white KKK members, they ride into town and law and order is restored. Um, and so as the this film in 1915 was such a big hit throughout the U.S., even the U.S. president had it. Um, the first film ever shown in the White House was Birth of a Nation, right? It was big. And so with all of our discussions of nativist reactions, this definitely had this huge propaganda filled element with it. Um, you know, kind of uh, igniting those embers, right, of nativist reactions, uh, anti-immigrant reactions, um, and, you know, just trying to consolidate closer towards um, just us, right, as, let's say, the U.S., as Americans, um, versus the immigrants, the Catholics, the Jews, anyone else trying to come into our country. Obviously, this is greatly hypocritical because the United States is all immigrants, right? Almost no one here has any direct ancestral link aside from possibly just Native Americans, right? Everyone else here is just immigrants. Um, even if you want to go back as far as saying Native Americans here are immigrants as well from, you know, 10,000 years ago when they're crossing the ice bridge towards North America, but that's perhaps going too far. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting piece of propaganda. Um, and so we talked about this before a little bit, but the socio-racial theories of social Darwinism come into play here as well, which are utilized in the film and utilized by the KKK and also utilized in the general practice of nativism as well. So social Darwinism is being peddled at this state in time. Um, and the theory, um, they took the theories of Char Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, the wonderful, beautiful work that he created in a very scientific biological way after studying finches in the Galapagos Islands next to Madagascar. Uh, and so that ended up turning into the theory of evolution, which is the basis of biology for right science. Now these, uh, whatever you want to call them, these fabricators, these racists, these, um, you know, social engineers, they took the work of Charles Darwin and they sort of morphed and bastardized it into their own uh, monstrous creation. And so they took the themes of Darwinism and turned it into social Darwinism to try to explain um, their version of the world and why things were the way they were. And so such as individuals are inherently superior or more intelligent or better suited at certain things because of their makeup. And so this can be used either for a socioeconomic pur purpose or a, bi or a racial one. So a socioeconomic example would be, uh, well, white folk are more wealthy than the black folk because our genetics allows us to be such and they are inferior and so they deserve to be poorer. Or let's say the racial element, just straight up racial element would be, uh, well, you know, the white folk are, you know, more evolved and advanced than, let's say, the black folk um, or anyone else. And so we deserve to be in a higher position here and there. Um, and even going as far, and my apologies for getting a, a little bit too graphic into this or a little bit too verbal, but I don't want to sugarcoat the history here. Um, and so as far as to go as, because what does this painting and picture, right, this cartoon um, show on the right-hand side, showing that, well, the black folk, right, they kind of, uh, they are heralded, heralded from Africa. Um, they are more ancestrally linked with apes and chimpanzees. And so, you know, we are more evolved from them. And so obviously that, it's, that is a whole load of, um, you know, falsities. Um, and so here we have this visual representation of Darwin, right? Kind of on the body of a chimp or a monkey. Um, and so these social, social racial theories, right? Obviously were, you know, disproven, discredited in so, so many number of ways. But it's important to understand in the context of the period of time, how nativism came to be, how all of these other elements popped up at the same time and how they all intermingled, right? Because nativism does not necessarily just stem by itself, right? It's usually interconnected with all these various themes of the day and age. 
let me get my pointer here. And so this will be a perfect example, right, from the map on the left-hand side of some of the things the social Darwinists would uh, talk about. Um, so, for instance, they would take a bust or, or a skull of a Caucasian, right, a white, and say, well, the skull is a various shape such as this, right, the right shape. Uh, but if we look at the uh, African-American, their skull shape is a little bit, um, you know, uh, twisted like this, maybe perhaps similar to a uh, chimpanzee. And so somehow they made the correlation and say, well, they're closely related to chimps. Um, and so this obviously has absolutely no basis in modern uh, science and has been discredited and disproven time and time again. But once again, right, it feeds into that nativist policy. Um, nativism and all of this uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, socio-Darwinism um, also has its day and age, even when it comes to the United States as a whole in general, right? Even, let's say, beyond, let's say, race relations, but going into an entire nation relation. Um, here's Uncle Sam, right, trying to teach self-government and civilization plus education too. Puerto Rico, the Hawaiians, the Philippines, Guam, and China over here, right? The Asian communities. And so the implicit understanding that um, the United States has developed far more than others. Our self of government has developed far more than others. And our uh, communities and our race has developed far more than others. Here are two interesting videos to watch for the Second Era clan. And if you notice, they are not here meeting uh, in random underground bunkers ashamed. These are both very public parades throughout the United States. On the right-hand side, right outside of Congress in Washington, D.C. And so, you know, this is a very real part of U.S. history. And it still rears its ugly head here and again. Even a few years ago in Charlottesville, Right with all the tiki torches, uh, we started seeing very close to like what a neo-Nazi movement right was portraying in the modern day. Um, obviously, I'm not here saying that all whites are bad. They're not right, um, and so. But there's always a subsect of the population that is extreme, and the extreme side of this population in this era happens to be the KKK. And nativist reactions are not necessarily always linked just merely with the KKK. Nativist reactions, I would probably put it as nativist reactions would be kind of like the big underlying uh, feeling of the time if there are massive migration waves. So people start to get threatened with their job securities. People start to get threatened with cultural exchange. They start to get threatened with just, you know, the time's changing too much and maybe their neighborhood's changing too much. At the extreme versions of that, we'll have, let's say, KKK, right? At the very extreme sect of the society. Um, so let's just put all of that into context, shall we? So here we have America's first, right? One God, one country, one flag. And so the wives and daughters of all of the uh, KKK members, right, um, are also proudly marching, right, with their hoods and robes. So this is not only necessarily a white male dominated um, uh, endeavor, right, in various parts of the country, but also a family um, endeavor as well. Of course, we have our various hoods here, right, um, the Klansmen. Now, um, in conjunction with um, the uh, discussion of uh, nativism, there's also a counter to the counter, which is the Jazz Age. Um, and so this is a nice perspective of the Harlem Renaissance uh, within the Jazz Age because it shows a, you know, a counter to the counter of <clears throat> the nativist kind of reaction. Um, and so African Americans at the time really started to come uh, come forward um, together into what is known as the Jazz Age, uh, bringing forth the, one, some of the best music uh, artists, painters of the day and age from Harlem, New York, um, and you know giving birth to the music genre of jazz. Right, this beautiful freestyle form of music and expression where every artist in the band can play together in intertwined harmony and occasionally go into a solo and the others kind of let them do their thing and then they kind of intermix. It's very lively. If you've ever been to a jazz club, 
you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you still have not ever been to a jazz club, definitely put it on one of your bucket lists. Um, and so a counter argument here that we had was the rise of Negro nationalism, um, proposing that African Americans had a distinct and separate national heritage that should be inspired and you know having a sense of community. Um, and so where the nativists were, you know, uh, telling everyone that, uh, you know, people are unwanted, we don't, do not want change, etc. The Negro nationalism was uh, incorporating more folks from uh, other parts of the world. Uh, yes, more from the black community, obviously, right, for Negro nationalism. However, um, they still are incorporating more of kind of the abroad element. We have uh, intellectual powerhouses like Webb Du Bois, uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, being proponents of, let's say, a pan-Africanism. Um, McKay's poem, If We Must Die, 1919, has this wonderful response to the race riots of the Ku Klux Klan and others, saying, If we must die, let it not be like dogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark and uh, the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. Like men will face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying but fighting back. And so it is a love poem, it is a love letter towards the fact that they will die, um, you know, upon the hill where which they stand. They will fight to the last and not, uh, let's say, succumb to all of this nativist and sometimes hyper racist reactions. Beautiful jazz age, right? Um, kind of being this, uh, you know, wonderful spot of enlightenment and, uh, you know, intellectualism, right? And artistic endeavors, right? Coming forward. Um, so, you know, opposite sides of the spectrum, you know, completely opposite sides. But, you know, U.S. history, it's a very interesting spot. Here's the Harlem Renaissance, just a little bit of an additional kind of uh, fact. Uh, and you know some videos uh, for you to watch. Uh, so definitely give this video a watch if you have a few minutes of spare time. And here are some modern U.S. nativism debates. They are a little bit on the longer side. The one on the uh, upper right-hand corner from MSNBC. Um, it is from Rachel Maddow. It is perhaps a little bit longer. I believe it was around the 15-20 minute mark. The one on the bottom from uh, from Tucker from Fox News has the more of the conservative perspective. So, throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, nativism has remained alive. Now, I do have to state this. It is not a uniquely United States perspective. It is not something we just suffer here in the U.S. This is global. It is a human characteristic of you and your people, whatever that may encompass. Whenever you have a large group of others coming in, there is going to be that kind of nativist reaction, right? Of like too much, too many immigrants are coming in, things are changing too much. And so the rhetoric of this ramps up typically when immigration numbers increase. Native peoples feel that the threat of their work culture or integration is at risk and that they feel that they have to protect their own interests over the interests of these others. And so the liberal perspective on the top um, gives the historic background and viewpoint of um, how the United States is a land of immigration, how the U.S. is a land of opportunity, and that at the heart of it, any nativist reaction in the United States should be abs absurd, right? Because we are a land of immigrants. So the argument is that, let's say, if, you know, I am an immigrant. I come to the U.S., make it my home. I gain citizenship. I am a U.S. citizen. And then let's say two years later, I see a bunch of immigrants coming into the country. What am I supposed to do? Tell them like, no, you're not accepted here. Get, get out of my country. It, it makes no sense. And so the conservative perspective here, though, on the other side of the foot is, well, this is our country and all of these folks are coming in. Um, whether documented, undocumented, in this particular case, he's talking about, from the conservative perspective, illegal immigrants, as the Democrats and the liberals would say, undocumented immigrants. Um, and he's saying, we have to protect our borders. We have to make sure that, uh, you know, migration flow is controlled. Um, and so it is a much more conservative perspective on, let's say, having very set borders, having law and order. Um, and, you know, protecting U.S. interests first over others for the United States not to be this haven for the rest of the world to just come into. Right. And let's say take advantage of. 
So two completely different perspectives, very interesting to watch. Um, so if you have the time, if you care to watch them, um, please feel free um, just to get both sides right of that argument. But with that, uh, we have the end of the chapter. Um, oh, I accidentally uh, did not put the uh, the correct chapter at the end. I'll fix that. But uh, we have the um, the midterms coming up, so definitely uh, focus on the midterms, um, and you know definitely try to um, you know bring forth our conversations of nativism um, into you know a good light. Um, and try to incorporate it into all of our discussions of ethnic identities, right? And understand the other context of the time, right? All these various things, all of these various ideas are intersectional, right? They're happening at the same time and they're intertwining and influencing each other. And so nativist reactions are always going to be at the heart of the, um, let's say, immigrant experience in any country, um, even even today, uh, in Europe, we're seeing large waves of, let's say, uh, Africans and Libyans trying to make their way into Italy. The Italians are trying to stop them, right, in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, this happens almost everywhere. But as far as U.S. history goes, we have definitely had an interesting history and very complex and sometimes hypocritical history of immigrants coming to the country, making it their home, and then telling other immigrants that they're not welcome. So. Uh, very interesting and a lot to think about. But with that, I just want to thank you for being here as always for listening to the lecture and I will see you next time during the next chapter. Take care.